So I'm going to jump right in. Is that okay? Yeah. Last week, my daughter wore my shoes when she preached. And uh, I guarantee you, I don't have hers on today. But I feel like I'm stepping in to her shoes. I, when I was in Italy, uh, the message that she spoke on was so relevant and so prophetic and so for right now for us church worldwide. Um, this is the day and age right now where the stakes are so high and we are fighting for the souls of men and women and children. We're fighting for families. We're fighting that the kingdom of heaven would be more populated than the kingdom of hell. And so we are with full resolve and full impact and with every passion that's in our body, we're coming for it. And so I just want to jump in today and tell you that, um, you know, being a Christian, it cost God all he had. It cost Jesus all he had. We know the price was overwhelming. But for those of us that were raised in church most of our lives, um, being a Christian is really easy. We just say a prayer and we're forgiven and we accept by grace that we've been saved by faith, not through our works. And um, we know Jesus died on the cross, but it's so amazing because the price has been paid, but you, you receive this gift of salvation. And uh, my daughter brought home the point that in this world, we have a lot of people that say they believe and they do believe. And, and by the way, just so you know, if you and I are in the state of just believing, uh, you can join the crowd of Satan because the Bible says he believes and trembles. So believing does not mean bring change in your life. And so when we really look at this in the gospels and when you read about Paul, there's only a few places in the Bible where the word Christian even comes up. It comes up in Luke, it comes up in other places. And the reason that it was is in those times, literally, there were a lot of philosophers, there were a lot of people that had disciples and had people that followed them. But the Bible says in Luke that the disciples were first Christians, which means to be Christ-like or a little Christ. It means I have now taken on his image and I'm now walking in the light as he is the light. It's more about just believing than it is taking action in your life that really changes everything in your life. It actually indicated a way of life, a term that shows up only three times in the Bible. Following the resurrection of Jesus, you hear this term, Christian, appear. And I, I think for all of us in this room today, um, we can define Christian however I need to define it. And we have a lot of people defining what a Christian is. And we can all get comfortable what Christian means to me. And I think we can have great discussion about that. But when it comes to the point of, am I a Jesus follower? It's kind of already defined. And it's not any longer open to discussion or debate. It's now, am I really following Jesus or am I just still trying to define what my special brand of Christianity is or my special belief is. And see, here's the challenge in life. Don't get mad at me. My name's PT. I love you. It says it right here on my new cup. See that right there? It says PT and I pastor G5 Church. There's a reason they do that. But here, here's what I can tell you. You can define and you can do whatever you need to do. But when it boils down to, am I really following Christ? Am I really a full-fledged follower of Jesus Christ? We see this in Luke. We see it in the disciples were called Christians at first in Antioch. And so right now you may be thinking and wondering, well, is a Christian really mean that somebody is really following Christ? And really in the church, it's so easy to become a Christian. We give you an opportunity at the every service to accept Jesus as your Lord, Master, and Savior. And, and I just want to let you know that Jesus wants you to go be with him in heaven. He doesn't want you in hell. There's nothing that can do that can keep you out of heaven except the rejection of Jesus Christ as Lord, Master, and Savior. Now, I got to tell you, I understand I'm not politically correct right now, and I really don't care. 
because I'm going to stand before God one day and God's going to say to me, hey, God, did you deliver the message that I gave you? And so I must please God and not man. And I think you in your life and in my life, we're now saying, you know what? I need to decide, am I going to please man or am I going to please God? So I don't want to try to define what Christian is or believer is. And my daughter kind of preached a message as I sat there at the pool, tears streamed down my face because here's a 23-year-old young lady standing up in culture and saying, as for me and my house. See, I believe God has a remnant of young people and you're gonna see them by the thousands coming into this place. You're gonna see worship nights here on Friday nights in these fields where it's just gonna be packed because I want you to know the Bible is so clear that we are about to have one of the greatest revivals ever in the history of our life. And let me tell you something, church, we've gotta be ready. And right now is not time for us to be just kind of smoothing along and going along. We gotta be in the fight, fighting for the hearts and souls and minds. I'm asking can I tell you something my wife and I came home and in the last two days just going out in restaurants and eating everywhere we go people are wanting to know where can I go to church and so I'm going to beg you to move from just being a Christian oh I'm a Christian oh I believe um if you allow me to get in your grill for a minute I, I just want to come as humbly and as reverently and as boldly as I can to you and say, uh, lukewarmness will no longer get it done in the kingdom. And so in your life, uh, men, I I'm coming after you in men lockers room uh, because here's what I can tell you, you got destiny. I was on the phone with a young man yesterday that's just going through all kinds of pain and, and decisions and confusions and who am I? And he's made some mistakes. And uh, I told him, I said, bro, do not give up on me. Do not give up in the battle. Get back in the fight because what God has planned for you is so much greater than anything that you can imagine that Satan's doing everything he can to keep you small and weak and broken and confused. The Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And so I want you to know those voices that are coming to you right now that are indicting you, that are telling you you're not good enough. Whatever it is he's saying, I just want to let you know you need to tell him to shut up and go to hell where he came from. I'm serious now, okay? So in your life right now, um, the term disciple always talks about somebody who is a Jesus follower. Matter of fact, the greatest commission in all the world, the great commission is go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples, not make Christians, not make believers. But right now, we, we all are believers. And so I just want you to know, I want you to fall in love with the Word of God. So there's this scripture in 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, that when I heard my daughter speak on this, um, it, it just riveted my soul and I can't get it off of my mind because Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Um, can, can I just... Can I just I'm not preaching today. I just want to have a chat with you, can I? Can I just deliver my heart? Um, Paul said, follow me. He's not saying, look at me. He's saying, look at the Jesus that's in me. But if you watch my life, if you watch what I do in my life, if you watch what I do in my relationships, if you watch what you do, I do in my business, if you watch what I do with my money, if you watch what I do with the people that are in my life, if you watch how I am with the people that I love, if you watch how I build my marriage, you can follow me because I'm following him. I didn't ask you how many scriptures you knew. I didn't ask you because people tell me all the time, well, I know the Bible. I go, okay. By the way, knowing gets you nothing. It's only when you do that the power is then released in your life and you move from this lukewarm space that he says, I'd rather you be cold or hot because if you're lukewarm, I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. Why does he wanna spit you out of his mouth? Because he hates you? No, because here's the problem. People that are looking on can't tell the difference between lukewarm and hot. And so they end up confused. 
And I have so many parents, don't get mad at me, going, well, I just want my children to decide on their own. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. And I got people right now that would walk up here on this stage and they would tell you, parents, do not leave it up to them. Train them, teach them, speak to them. But more than anything, dad, more than anything, dad, live it. Though it costs you everything you've got. See, this is the problem. I will follow Jesus until... You're going to mess with what I believe. The way I date, the way I deal with my money, the way I talk to my husband, the way I talk to my... Don't get in that. Just leave me alone. And God is going, if you knew why I hate lukewarm, it's because you are going to miss the joy that I have set before you. My wife and I just came back from Italy. I'm kind of ashamed to admit to you, but I've been an American Express card holder for 42 years. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I married a 20-year-old. What can I tell you? I don't know what to tell you. Can I tell you? I left, and everything I did was on those points. And they upgraded me. I literally walked into our room in Salentro, Italy, and Pastor, I cried. I'm a country boy. I'm not used to this high cotton junk. But we walked in and we just held each other. I would tell you whatever it is that it costs you, I promise, he promises, he's gonna return it back sevenfold, overflowing, pressed down, shaken together. Right now, some of you are in the middle of where you're trying to decide and you've lost your way and you're confused and you're depressed and you're full of anxiety and you're full of fear. And I just want you to know, God has something in store for you. And I just wanna let you know, last week when you heard this little girl standing up here and talking, this is somebody that is deceived decided to follow Jesus and it hasn't always been easy. There's nothing that breaks your heart more than to watch your children walk through pain when they're doing the right thing. If they're messing up, you're going, you deserve that. But when they're doing the right thing and you still suffer, that is a painful situation for a parent to go, I know. You see, every day of her life she gets offered, will you lower your standards? Every day in her life she says, will you just Shift your moral value for a minute and okay what is not okay. Oh, is, this is too strong, isn't it? It's not like, I don't think I'm coming back. I don't think I am either. I don't want to be seen after this. You know, there's this thing inside of her that says, well, I don't want to have to forgive. I, I don't want to have to say, I believe the word of God. Oh, no, it's, that's an old fogey thing. My pastor friend, he's over at pastor's. I have a lot of pastors that come here. They come through the gate. He does too. Can I tell you? The hardest children on the planet to reach are pastor's children. Because when it's spoken and it's not lived, it just brings such confusion. I've watched her over and over again, her and my son both, be tempted to surrender to peer pressure and talk like everybody talks and walk like they walk. And I've watched them have to forgive people that they've given their lives away to. I've, had, I've literally watched them sit and cry at people they've given the most to. You see, Tim, why are you talking about this right now? Because Jesus steps into society and he preaches this message called the Sermon of the Mount, Sermon on the Mount. I would encourage you to go read it. We're gonna put some of it up on the screen. Now, can I tell you, uh, when I was about 18, I had a friend of mine, he owned the world's largest airplane company, bought and load, sold and leased jets all over the world. He sent a private jet to Ohio. I lived in Ohio at the time, and flew me to D.C. to go see the Bee Gees. How deep is your love? How deep is your love? I stood in this Coliseum. I got to see the Bee Gees. They were smoking this wacky stuff around me. It about made me sick to my stomach. I looked over and said, what is that? He goes, that's weed. I'm like, ugh. 
weeds were something we killed in a garden. It wasn't something you smoked in your brain. But can I tell you, I'm standing there, I'm going, uh, you know, and then the room starts spinning. I'm just getting messed up, right? How many of you know that was pretty cool? These people were at the Sermon of the Mount. <laughs> I got invited to the White House. I got presidential cufflinks. These people were present when Jesus spoke on the Sermon on the Mount. I was able to be with Mother Teresa and, and stand and, and minister to her nuns and the nuns that were there. And, and these people got to be with Jesus when he gave the greatest sermon in all the world that shook the religious, believing Christians at their very foundation because he ups the bar. He comes in and says, oh, I know you named me, but I wanna know, are you willing to follow me? They even said, well, Lord, give us a chance to sit at your right or the left. And he said, that's not mine to give. I got a question for you. Are you willing to drink of the same cup that I drink from? This is the challenge. This is the invitation. This is the moment in your and my life right now where we can move into a life that you never even dreamed of. Men, get ready. God's going to bless you in ways you never thought he could bless you. But you cannot do it dragging yesterday's awfulness into your future. You can't do it. Ladies, you can't drag yesterday's pain into tomorrow's victories and expect to have a joyful life. So Jesus stands up in front of this crowd and he turns everything upside down. And he has the audacity to say this, love your enemies. You've got to be kidding. I'll get even with my enemies. I'll take them out. I'll, I'll post something on Facebook. And I'll let them know how bad of a person they really are. Because you didn't do what I wanted you to do. Oh, I know. This is too straight. And when somebody asks for a little, give them a lot. Really? I, I, I've got this thing going on in my life that if I do this, then you should do that. It's called the score game. Uh, he says, if somebody wants to borrow something from you, let them borrow it and don't even expect it to come back. If they ask you to go a mile, go an extra mile. And I'm summarizing this whole sermon that he preaches. Imagine how radical, how radical this would have been in the society that he was in. Uh, he said, by the way, if you're giving alms, give your money, but immediately go and if you have some relationship in your life that's broken, go repair it. If you want my power, if you want my grace, if you want my a miracle working power going on in your life, then he says these are the platform, these are the foundations, these are the things that are gonna make all the difference in the world. You can have peace, you can have joy, but you can't do it if you're not right with your brother if you're not right with your family, if you're not right with your neighbor. Um, he said, I just want you to stop looking at the speck in somebody else's eye and look at the big two before that's in yours. I always worry, and right now, um, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but we now have Christian sex, people that are in different philosophies and theologies that now have went to Facebook and social media and started attacking each other. And Satan's just having a field day. Because his greatest thing in his life right now, listen to me, is for you to start dividing and devouring one another. That way you can't even fight the battle that's in front of you. So in your life right now, the Bible says when he talked, the people's eyes were open and they they were so amazed at his teaching. Why? Because as he taught with one who had authority. He was a king who had authority, not as the teachers that just teach the law. Be careful of your mentors in your life. Be careful of who you're following. And I want to say this to you, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't have a mentor, if you don't have a pastor, if you don't have someone guarding your soul, if you're doing it all on your own and you're making it up as you go, 
I just want to beg you as your friend. That will never work. It's never worked from the beginning of time. We need one another. We've got to have one another. So imagine this. Bless those who curse you. It was epic, but it was disturbing. Really. You know how many friends of mine right now are calling me every week and going, I will never forgive them. And I'm going, you better forgive them. You better begin to pray for them. And you better begin to figure out how to bless them. Because when you do this, it's going to open the windows of heaven and God is going to move you from just being a believer to being a full-fledged follower of Jesus Christ. He taught with one that had authority. And Jesus comes down from the mountainside. These large crowds, they follow him. And there's this guy named John the Baptist. And the Bible says that... uh, he was kind of a warm-up act. He, he said, hey, there's one greater than me coming. I'm not even worthy to tie his shoelaces. And the Bible said he wore really cool clothes and ate really weird food. I think he ate Big Macs and Butterfingers too. <laughs> there was something different about Jesus. He spoke with authority and he spoke with so much love. And wherever he went, the atmosphere would change. Um, Dad, when you walk in your home, when you stand in the presence of your wife, or men, the woman that you're dating, does the atmosphere change? Not for the bad. But can the presence of God be felt? When you want to get angry and yell, and yet you keep the peace of God on you. Uh, There's this incredible story um, where this leopard comes to Jesus, and he has this face-to-face meeting, but there's a massive crowd there, and, 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 and this leopard shows up. Have you ever been in a building and somebody shows up that doesn't look like everybody else? And there's this moment where the crowd watches as this dude shows up, this leopard. And Jesus is standing there and the leopard says to Jesus, listen to this. If you're willing, Lord, if you're willing, would you make me clean? Imagine the tension in the air. Imagine all these people watching A leopard asked for a miracle. (laughs) This is the stuff where God wants you to go. He wants you to begin to believe him, walk with him, stand with him, and believe that God of the universe will anoint you and call you. And if you call on his name, people will be saved, they will be healed, and they will be set free. But the enemy wants to keep you guilty and broken and stuck in your yesterdays and stuck in sin. And God's going, no, 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 I came that you could be free. Now Jesus had just taught, blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, and now they're encountering it. Now they're watching what he said. Does it match up to how he lives? It's kind of like you and I in our lives. Do what I say, do I even know how to live differently, think differently. I I was going to speak on depression today, and I probably will push it out for about two or three weeks, but the most amazing research on depression is this, that if you will name it and define it, you have a 90% better rate at dealing with it just by defining it. (laughs) I'm willing, Jesus says, (laughs) have you had that moment with Jesus where you were guilt ridden and you were couldn't help yourself and you said Lord if you would be willing and he says I am willing I'm willing I love this 
And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. And the crowd, this large crowd, it just goes wild. I mean, this guy is talking and he's living. And this guy walks away cleansed. Can you imagine what's going on in his heart today? You see, I want to remind you that you can leave here today completely healed, completely delivered, completely set free. It's amazing. So this is kind of that moment. Um, this is kind of a weird analogy, but I, I, I think you're going to get what I'm saying. Uh, it's that moment in your life where you're watching this, and it's kind of like a 17-year-old boy who is down in the basement with your daughter, covered up with a blanket, with the light off, and the dad walks in the room and flips the light on. The question is not, how do you feel? We all know how he feels. Oh, no. The question is, is what happens? Next. Mm. Jesus. With a woman caught in the very act of adultery. Neither do I condemn thee. Now go and sin no more. It's this place where faith comes alive. And I'm not just saying I believe, but I'm receiving. And church, I want us to get ready to begin to receive and believe from God to pray and ask him for the help. Another story is a centurion came to him and they, he says, Lord, I, 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 need, I, need, I need for someone to be healed. Uh, I, I need for this to happen. Now, you got to understand the history here. If you go all the way back to the history, it was, it was the centurions. It was these people through the history that caused Jesus to be crucified. And now he's meeting him face to face and Jesus is saying, what do you want me to do? He should have been angry. He should have been like, no, no. That what you've done in my life, the history of our lives, the, 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 the legacy of what you've done to me to get me here. And so all the people are watching. And so Jesus says, well, what do you want me to do? Go read the story. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. And Jesus tells this story. He goes, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, do you want me to come and heal? And he said, no, sir, I'm a man that also is a lot like you. I'm, I, I have authority. He said, if you will just speak the word, he'll be healed. Um, I want to say something to you right now. If you're having trouble concentrating right now, it's because the enemy does not want you to hear that you have power by the hand of God to do great exploits. And yet the Lord wants you to be comfortable. The Lord wants you to be on fire and Satan wants you to stay comfortable and let this be something that somebody else does in their life. But I want to tell you, God is calling you. He's calling you. We live in that day and age right now of it's the professionals. It's the, it's the people that we hire to do it. You're supposed to do it. I challenge you to stand up. See, it's this gravity of the moment where you and all, I have been in this place where, honestly, I've hurt people. I, I've done things I shouldn't have done to people. There are things that have happened in my life that I'm not proud of. And now I'm having to come to the very person that I hurt. And I'm having to ask for a favor. That's the centurion. And he humbles himself. And he watches Jesus Christ heal and forgive I just want you to know today that God is trying to move us from being believers, from more than being a Christian, to really being able to say to one another, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. It shows up. It shows up in my life. I not know it. I live it. Jesus encounters this woman at the well and 
he speaks to this woman. Matter of fact, he wasn't supposed to speak to a Jewish Sumerian woman. He wasn't supposed to have a conversation. And here he is breaking all the religious norms to let somebody know, I love you. She was shocked that a Jew would even speak to her. You can remember that Peter and all these men, they were mere men like you and I. They had a lot of prejudice in them. They had a lot of stuff in them that needed to be forgiven. For goodness sakes, Paul killed Christians, and now he writes two-thirds of the New Testament, and you're going to tell me that God can't anoint you? You're going to tell me that you're going to keep living your life under the world's way because you don't feel worthy to be what God's called you to be? It's amazing the tension and the emotion that Jesus brings up in these people's lives. It's like the centurion asking for help. He knew, he knew his history. The woman knew her history. And they were more than just saying, I want to believe. They were going, I want to receive and I want to move forward. You see, Jesus had the right to hate. He had the right to tell him that blood is on your hands for what you've done. He had the right to tell them everything they had ever done and put a a, a feeling of just guilt and shame on them. But instead... When you come to God, he never speaks to your yesterdays or even your present. He always speaks to your future. And so I want you to hear me right now. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you live. I don't know where you're at. But God had you get online today. Because God has got something way bigger planned for you. And you don't know it. So you just keep operating Kind of like a person that's in prison, just one more day. I will tell you, if you don't understand this about God, you won't build your marriage, you won't build your finances, you won't build your children, you'll waste your life, you'll spend your life, you won't invest your life. And so I just want to challenge you. One of the dreams of my heart is I just want to see men stand up. I just want to see us walk differently. I want to see us be who we were meant to be and understand the grace of God and the gift of God and the mercy of God and the power of God and the blessing of God. I want to see women just get in all that God wants them to do. You understand that in society, women had no value until Jesus came on the throne. And now he says, I want you to know, be elevated. Be elevated. We've all been there. We've all been there in our lives where we've had to come back and we needed a job recommendation. We, we needed something in our lives that we didn't deserve. And God is begging us right now, would you now begin to live the Sermon of the Mount, not just know it, not just believe in it, You see, we all believe in it. I want you to treat me this way. I just have got to decide if I'm going to treat you that way. Am I going to be offended? Am I going to be hurt? Am I going to be upset if it doesn't go my way? What's going to happen? I I don't like your message, so I'm not coming back. I get that. I don't like my own messages. (laughs) But I'm telling you, I'm asking God to change me. To change me. Right now in your life, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder where you are. I wonder if you've forgiven, but you're still in pain. I I, got to tell you, I have great integrity in this because the scars on my body are not from people that hated me. They were from people that I helped the most, who hurt me the deepest. And my wife will tell you, by the grace of God, men and women, as soon as I feel the pain, I immediately turn and go, I'm going to bless you. The people that have hurt me the deepest in my life, I have plans 
And I'm asking God to give me the ability to bless them beyond anything they could ever imagine. Why? Because the Bible says when you do this, you heap burning coals on their head. Don't get even. Rise above it. Rise above it. Following Jesus is moving beyond what is reasonable. Following Jesus is moving beyond what is reasonable and even what's expected. It's difficult. It's unnatural. It's beyond natural. It's supernatural. It's the power of God in us. It's the hope of God in us. Church, if we come alive, do you understand what God's going to do with us? The enemy is hoping that we stay, honestly, asleep. He's hoping that we stay in, in bondage to what we know is not the best for our lives. He says, what good does it do you if you do good to those that do good to you? What credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. I can tell you there are two things about Christians that separate you from everybody else in the world. Full out followers of Jesus Christ. One is your love. The Bible says they will know us because of our love one for another. The other one is simply this. Than any other denomination, any other religion. Let me tell you what it is. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. It's amazing when you're forgiven how that moves you into a whole different place. It moves you out of insecurity into knowing that I am completely loved. When Jesus came back into Capernaum, he said, Lord, my servant is home and he's paralyzed terribly. And when you read this scripture about the centurion and he's telling Jesus who, do you understand the centurion had murdered thousands of people? with no thought. And he's coming to Jesus and going, I have a servant at home that is in pain. You're going, wait, wait, wait. You mean to tell me this guy that doesn't have a heart now has a heart? How many of you have ever had somebody around you that has radically changed and you're going, hold on a minute. I don't know if this is real or not. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because isn't it true that most of the time it's not right? They say what they say. And you've got to be careful that what I'm saying right now, you don't try to twist it to make yourself right. There's only one righteous, and we need to come and say, God, help me change. And here is this dude saying, they're suffering. God grants his request. Do you understand how dangerous this is for Jesus? Do you understand how dangerous it is to talk to a woman at a well? Do you understand how dangerous it is to forgive a woman, an adulteress? Do you understand how dangerous it is for Jesus to heal somebody that the crowd thinks doesn't deserve healing? Mm. Some of you, I'm just telling you, I love you. My name's PT. You're about to change your life and a lot of people around you are not going to like it. Because you're no longer going to be manipulated by evil. You're now going to walk in the light as he is the light. He could have lost the working class. You have no idea what it took for him in his own life. The sacrifice in his own life. Jesus is just continually showing us over and over and over and over that we can live a different life. God expects you to be a full-fledged follower. If he saved you, if he redeemed you, I can tell you, he's waiting for you and I to completely give our all. Yeah, God, he changed everything. He no longer believed and told the crowds that women were worth nothing. They're an object. They're a thing. No, he established their value. 
He established the broken and the bruised and the sick and the lame, and he, he assigned value to them. So I just want to ask you, here's how he closes. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, this is such a strong, strong rebuke. Is like a foolish man. Everyone who heard this sermon, they knew that Jesus was talking more about than just saying words. He really was saying, I want to see this show up in your behavior and in your actions and in your lifestyle. Now, this sounds like a drudgery if you're indebted to sin. But once you've been freed, there is so much freedom in walking in the light as he is the light. There's so much joy. There's so much peace. There's so much blessing that it's even hard to find words. Here's what he said. The person who hears the words of mine and refuses to put them into action is like a foolish man, especially. They're a fool because they have fooled themselves. Some of you, I love you. You're so smart, you manipulate yourself. You justify. And I just want to say to you, you will miss the greatest blessings of your life until you fully surrender your life. We all know how this ends. Uh, we, we see what happens in men and women's lives who continually walk on in rebellion. The Bible says there's a way that seems right unto man, and it ends in destruction. There's no man or woman ever dealt with sin in their life and kept continually doing it and ever survived it. I was talking to a friend of mine this week, and I'm closing. And he said, Tim, you know, um, God's tried to bless me multiple times. And he said, I just want to confess this to you. Because of my pride, I wouldn't accept it. This is a man that just got a $10,000 check because he was willing to humble himself. Where has pride grabbed you? And now even when you're confronted, you get angry. You leave. If you understood how much he loves you. So here's my invitation to you. Here's my cry to you. Here's my plea to you. Let's not be content with just being believers. Let's not be content with just being Christians. I want to beg you and your family, as for me and my house, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's going to show up in my words. It's going to show up in my actions. It's going to show up on my deeds. God is not this killjoy man. He actually is a releaser of joy. But the world has so confused us to what joy is in our lives. So, Jesus would say, I expect you to follow through. I compel you right now to let the kingdom of God come into your heart and in your life. And here's what Jesus' invitation is today, and I want to offer it to you. Follow me. Follow me. On my next men's call, I'm going to talk on the power of an example. Follow me as I follow him. Dads, I want you to take your children and go, follow me as I follow him. And one day, you will be where I am. And that is the child and the children that I raised are now ministering to me. 
Young people, don't settle. Ladies, don't settle. Men, don't settle. And don't get religious. The world is full of people, and this is why we're so confused, that know the Bible backwards and forwards. They speak in tongues. They would see things, and, and you look at their lives, and it's just not there. I was 21 years old, and I had accomplished every goal I wanted to accomplish in my life. And I was standing in a group of men that everybody wanted to be in this group. They all wanted to be in this clique. And I stood there. I'm not better than anybody. But I went, God, there has to be more than this. There has to be more than this. And let me tell you where I found the more to be is in simplicity and in clarity. We keep trying to get more and more complicated. You keep trying to figure God out and God is just going, simply trust me. Live simply and live abundantly because I will bless you. But you got to remove the blessing blockers. Follow me. And we will astonish the world at a brand of love that they know nothing of. It's easier to be a Christian than it is to be a follower of Jesus. It's easier to say I'm a believer. It's easy to study the word of God. It's easy to pray, 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 and then not treat people around me with the love and the dignity and the honor that he wants me to have. Here's a really funny thing, a really funny thing. Are you ready? This is gonna shock you. This is gonna mess with your theology. Jesus never invited anybody to become a Christian. He invited them, follow me. I have decided to follow Jesus. Yeah, sing it with me. I If you've decided to follow him today, I just want you to stand up in your seat right now and say, I am going to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. So let's do it one more time together. And as you stand, I want it to be a declaration out of your mouth. This is no longer going to be that I'm going to be a Christian or I'm just going to be somebody that's a believer. I have decided. I have made a decision. I, I don't understand it all. All my doubts are not gone. I'm not all perfect. I, I, don't, I don't have it all together. Nobody does. But I've decided. Are you ready? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. So here's what the Bible says. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so today, I want to open this invitation for those of you that have never asked him to be Lord of your life. You've never said, Lord, I, I want to follow you. I, I, want to, I want to answer the call. And then I also want to speak to some of you that you were on fire at one time. You, you were a full-fledged follower of Jesus Christ. And you moved into the believer category. You moved into, I'm a Christian. Let's get rid of the titles. And let's get into action. See, God will say, you can't just believe, you have to act. And so today, we're going to act, church. So right now, if you've never accepted him as your Savior and said, I'm going to be a follower, repeat this. Everybody repeat this prayer with me online, in all of our family rooms, all of our, come on, let's do it right now. Dear Jesus, I want to follow you. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Help me get into my destiny. Lord, I accept you as my Lord, Master, and Savior. I'm going to live for you 
Holy Spirit, teach me and guide me. I'm going to be on fire for you. I'm going to tell others of your grace. In Jesus' name, I pray. Would you raise your hands right now, Father? I pray for every person that's under the sound of my voice right now. Lord, I know some of us are broken. This is what church is, Lord. We are people that come together and we carry one another's burdens. We confess our faults one to another. We, we say, you know what, I've been a little cool in this area, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to heat up. I'm going to get my life back on track. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be all that he created me to be. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to follow Jesus. Lord, I pray for strength. I pray for courage. I pray, Lord, right now it's easy sometimes when we're in a crowd like this to make decisions and commitments. But, Lord, right now I pray for strength to carry through on our commitment of following you. Lord, we're going to let our lives bring glory and honor and praise to your name. I thank you for every man under the sound of my voice, every woman under the sound of my voice, every teenager under the sound of my voice, every child under the sound of my voice. I thank you, Lord, that you are going to bless them and multiply them and increase them and build them and show them and guide them and put them on the path and the destiny of following Jesus. And Lord, I know this, wherever we follow you, it's going to be the most exciting, most fulfilling, the most meaningful life we could ever have. Lord, encourage us today. Strengthen us by your great power. I, I want us just to sing. Can we sing just the course of that? Give me Jesus. Can you do that with me? And then we're going to go eat and we'll be ready to run.